right. Continuing our latest presentation, this is Boulder Arsenal assessment for coaches. Mr. Neil Stramo, Nikki Burrows are our presenters. Neil Stramo is the director of the uh, NGB National Government Money for the Sport of Bowling for the United States of America. Applause. <laughs> Rose is one of our head research engineers for the Sports Inspects Department. <laughs> and this presentation comes because I asked them, you know, what do the coaches need? And I said they need a better understanding of uh, Arsenal system for the bowlers. You know, you can sometimes the engineers they get so up above our head. Uh, some of you sat through the next presentation, some of that stuff is just way up there, but everything. I think you're going to find this a very practical way to actually make an arsenal set in the bowler. So, before we go any farther, I mean, I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Great, thank you. Everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, am I too loud or too quiet or just, just right? You're too quiet. Just right for the front, too quiet for the back. So, I'll stand in the middle. All right, well, I don't know everybody in this room. Um, it's been great seeing a lot of old faces. Recent faces, old friends, um, it's been a good time, but I don't know everybody here, so as uh, Rod said, I'm the Managing Director of the National Government Body. That really involves um, equipment specifications, Team USA, the ITRC, coaching. What that really means is um, I oversee those areas. I don't get to spend the time doing the fun stuff, the research, time out in the ITRC, time working with Carol in the coaching department. I do a lot more of the administrative crap. <laughs> <laughs> not, as, not as much fun as it used to be. So getting to stand up once in a while is, uh, is kind of fun for me. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer, as is Nikki. I, I grew up in bowling now. My parents owned a center when I was a kid. I owned lanes by hand. I was a mechanic. You know, then I went to school, I became a mechanical engineer, and I worked in aerospace, um, worked on the A330, A340, anybody flew on one of those on the way here maybe. Um, worked on the F-15E fighter jet in the U.S. So some cool, some cool stuff, that was, that was fun. <coughs> and then I went into nuclear power. Now those of you that know me know that I like to, you know, kind of have some fun and, you know, I'll have a beer or two and, you know, I just like to geek out from a, a bowling bowling game standpoint. And uh, for some reason, nuclear power, just, it just, it's just not as much fun. <laughs> you still want to allow you to have as much fun. You go into work there, it's just a little too serious for me. So I spent uh, a little too long in nuclear power. And um, when I had the chance to work for ABC back in Wisconsin, you know, I jumped at the chance. And it's kind of a circle of life. You started bowling, back in the bowling, you know, so it works out, works out well. Um, normally when, when Nikki and I, so Nikki, I, I don't know, I'm going to introduce her, she's not going to introduce herself, I'm going to introduce her, because she's, she's worked with us since 2008, but she had been with us a couple of times before that, and we had to have her back, and um, she's a mechanical engineer from University of Wisconsin Platteville, she bowled um, in high school, she bowled collegiately there as well, and um, now she's the research manager spends time with the research department looking at, of course, a lot of different things. But she spent a lot of time since she's been here um, with Six Sigma, which is a statistical um, analysis group, and she's become a uh, flat belt with them, which means from a uh, st statistical, that's a hard word for me to say, a statistical analysis standpoint, she's, uh, she's, you know, she's right there. She's, she's all over it and um, can look at things from a completely different standpoint, and we love having her. So normally, her and I, during uh, seminars like this, we'd be giving you know more of the higher technology um, seminar. We'd be talking some of the more technical aspects of bowling. But after you know seeing uh, you know Brian yesterday, and of course Dell and Nick earlier, Nick talking about angular momentum and and anatomical kinesiology, or however you pronounce that, it's even harder than statistical. So we're doing a little bit more of a, of a fun topic, in my opinion. We're, we're, and it's a little more
more basic. Now, how we got there from the ball motion study was kind of a little technical, but we had a lot of help from the, from the industry on that. And so it's a little more, more of a fun topic, but I think useful. You know, in, in talking with Rod, wanted to be able to have, now not everybody here has a team, but this works with individuals, but I think we're great with a team. Those of you who have a, a national team or a collegiate team or a high school team or what have you, I think it works really well in that setting. So we'll get to that. So of course we got right after lunch, and everybody ate. A lot of people are from about 10 time zones away, and this is your second day here. You know, this is standard snooze time. Everybody got a handout, they hand up, I should have been a pillow, but uh, <laughs> hopefully everybody have a handout, everybody get one. Um, it's the uh, ball motion analysis form and the instructions to go with it. We're just gonna go through this and talk about ways to utilize that to help you and your team. So to keep people awake, I'll, I'll probably call on a few people that could help give a different point of view, a different way to say, say something. All right, so that was that was slide one. Hopefully they don't all take, take that long. All right, this one will be faster. So this is just we're going to go over the ball motion analysis form. We're going to talk about data collection. We're going to talk about different um, surface adjustments and how that affects the data collection that, that you already have, how we can adjust that, even balance holes perspective as well. And uh, then we'll do some questions. <coughs> so our goal was to bring the ball motion study, you know, all that <coughs> testing that we had done in such a you know scientific manner, how can we relate that? How can we help bowling? And of course, you gotta go through the coaches if you truly want to help as many bowlers as possible. So we came up with this, this form. It's relatively easy to obtain these measurements, although there's a, a handful of things you have to have, and, and we'll go over that in a minute here. Um, and you know, and then of course it's an on lane kind of a thing, and, and a lot of stuff you need are pro shop items. So the The relationship between these measurements and the influence on ball motion was verified through the ball motion study. It allows you to do these comparisons directly, but it really has to be within the same scope. And what I mean by that is, you know, with the same with the same bowler, um, you can compare bowling balls to bowling ball, but you really should do this separately for like long, medium, and short patterns. You know, you're going to get different results in in those scopes and allows for complete analysis of the arsenal. And I, I would do this with, if you got six balls, six key balls for an arsenal for one of your bowlers, maybe it's four, maybe it's five, maybe it's 10. Um, I would do it for each, each ball for each bowler. And personally, I would do it on long, medium, and short for each one. But as you get going through this, you'll learn, as you do this with your bowlers, you'll learn um, what works best for you and what you really need. All right, so talking about equipment and what we need. Now, I've, I've already talked about how versatile uh, Nikki is. I'm not sure be Vanna White. Vanna White for us over here. Um, so you guys thought that this was a fun, handy, like nice take home item from the conference. It's actually your ball motion analysis for equipment bag. So now everybody can store all their items in their take home bag. All right, so I don't think she's going to pull in bowling balls out of the, out of the bag, but um, obviously you need the balls. <laughs> and we need copies of the form, so you're going to need, for, for every ball, you're going to need one of these, for every ball every pattern, really. Um, a pro set? So we, we like to use a pro set. So you can use it. Quarter scale is, is, is useful as well, but the thing with the ProSec is you get the protractor on it in order to be able to measure the angles as well. So this is the one we use. And an armadillo. Okay. And we have we actually have two. One of them is a little unique. And we'll explain that later. <coughs> but, uh, nope. You don't need two. No, you don't. One, one works. Um, grease pencils. Hiding in there. Um, oh, 
Well, yeah. with the grease pencils, real quick, I, I like to have a couple different colors. I mean, typically they'll either be white or yellow. Um, we like to have both colors with us sometimes because some of them show up better on the different colored bowling balls, or they photograph a little bit better depending on what you're looking at. So um, take a couple colors, take a handful of them with you because they break pretty easily if you drop them on the floor. Thanks to that extent, and you're really trying to do this quickly in the home lane. All right, now we'll see how versatile she is because the next one is the determinator. <laughs> There's not one in here, but this could be our second Disney movie reference of the day. If I was Mary Poppins, I could work this bag a little bit better, but it's not in there. Sorry, guys. So, how many people here are really have a pro shop? They're pro shop people. I'll kind of put that. It's a good a good percentage. Now, as you're drilling balls. I hope you use the determinator to lay it out because as we all know, hopefully we all know, markings sometimes are very, very close, sometimes kind of close, sometimes kind of bad. So it's, it's critical in my opinion to utilize the determinator to verify your marks and then lay out your ball based on that. We also use this then, as you'll see in the videos, um, to gather the data. All right, so we're going to need then some sanding pads. I think it's helpful to keep them in a Ziploc bag because as you're using them throughout the time, I mean, it's going to get all over the rest of your stuff. They're, they get kind of dirty and gunky, so it's kind of nice to have them in a bag separately. Ball cleaner, yeah. and really that's, um, you know, I'm not talking, you know, the adrenaline wipes. So this will be, we'll be using this in the middle of, of the testing. It's something you just want to clean the surface of the ball so it's nice and, and crisp so that when we're trying to measure the flares on the ball, you can actually see them as best as possible. Yeah, something basic. We have Storm Extra Clean that we were using earlier. I mean, Power Wash by Ebonite, you name it. So an approved cleaner that's on the list on Google.com. And then, of course, the towel, you'll need that out on the lanes, too. The other item that's not on the list that I like to include is a ball cup. Um, they're going to be really useful to throw a couple in your bag. This one I really like because it's flat, it's neoprene. Um, it, it, it helps it not slide on the table. It also stores nicely in my bag. But um, throw a, a roll of tape something in your bag so that the ball isn't rolling around. Very good. Moving on. So the ball motion analysis form itself. Now, everybody has a copy in front of them. I would, you know, we'll, we'll utilize this as we're going through the presentation, take it home, make copies of it. But this is where it's located online. <coughs> if you can click on that and just pull it up real quick. You know, it's on bowl.com, on the uh, specs page. And then down here we have, we have all the videos we're about to show you are located here. And then the form itself, in case you need more copies, that's where it's at along with the instructions that you have a copy of all. The, uh, the QR code that's on the form will take you directly to this page of Google.com. Sometimes on mobile devices it can be a little a little clunky to navigate on Google.com, so this actually just takes you right to that page. Um, if you have an Apple device, sometimes it doesn't like to play as nicely. So just make sure you've got like the YouTube app downloaded as well and then it should work. Um, that's the one thing we found is when we were testing it out, it wasn't a huge fan of playing the videos if we didn't have the app as well. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. All right. Sorry, I'm sure. All right. So like I said, it's Go to the USB-C, inspect the page, forms and manuals, and that's where it's at. All right, so then we get to the data collection portion. And here we have a large ball <coughs> analysis form up here on the, on the flip chart. Follow along on yours. I know you can't read this, but obviously we're going to start across the top, very basic. You know, we want the name of the bowler and the, the date that we did this, center information, and the actual lane surface I find to be important because if you're not always doing it in the same place, you know, one time you might do it on wood, one time you might do it on pro lane, and it, you're going to have difficulty comparing some of those numbers. All right. And then the ball basics. So we want to make sure you're going to identify it, 
probably a lot of your bowlers have you know multiple holes of the same ball, so just throw the last four serial number down on the list or whatever works for you. And just a rough of the surface, you know, that way um, you're able to, to understand where you're at when you're doing the comparison because we're going to show you examples of the difference between, say, you know, a ball that's been used for a while and a fresh thousand or a fresh two thousand grit. And more basic stuff, um, the bowlers, the bowlers pap, so we're going to document that here um, from a drilling standpoint. Bowlers pap and the layout, how the ball is intended to be laid out. And any balance hole information, obviously, if it has, uh, has a balance hole, we want to put that on here, yes, no, and then diameter and depth. Again, that's important because maybe later or maybe based on the results, you don't want to change that. <coughs> All right. So as I pointed out on the web page, this, is, um, this follows right along with the videos in case you want to explain this or show this to someone else. And Nikki's going to jump in here and I'll make sure the videos are running. Sure. Thanks. Place the ball on the determinator with the pin aligned with the eye hole of the support. Turn the determinator on and trace the ball path through the eye hole. The ball will eventually spin about a fixed axis. This is known as the preferred spin axis, or PSA. This PSA represents the Y or higher G axis of the bowling ball. Mark the spot through the eye hole and the top of the arm, creating a small circle about the PSA. Using the ProSect, draw a line from the PSA towards and through the manufacturer pin of the bowling ball. Mark the point six and three quarter inches from the PSA along this line. This will represent your x-axis. Now draw a perpendicular line from the x-axis towards the equator of the bowling ball. Mark a spot six and three quarter inches down from the line from the x-axis. This will give you the z or intermediate rg axis. To ensure the accuracy of this location, take your prosect and measure perpendicular from the x-axis to y-axis line towards the z-axis. This line should directly intersect where your z-axis is marked and be six and three quarter inches in length. If they do intersect and your line is six and three quarter inches, you have correctly found all three axes. If not, be sure to check that your line are six and three quarter inches long, this is a quarter of a long ball circumference, and perpendicularly intersect at the axis location. Um, and as well, once you find your PSA, you're also getting your X, your X and your Z axes, um, which, which will lead into um, needing those in order to determine the spin time of the bowling ball. Um, PSA is your higher G axis, as um, was said in the video, and that's going to be important here. In order to find 60 degree spin time, the location of the x, y, and z axes must be known. The easiest way to find this point is to take your line between the x and y axis and mark the midpoint. This line should be six and three quarter inches long, so the midpoint will be three and three eighths inches from either axis. Draw a perpendicular line through the point. For a right-handed bowler, your mark should be right of the y to x axis line and left of the line for left-handers. Now that your T is drawn, mark the distance along that line that is 4 and 1 8 inches from both the Y and the X axis. If you correctly found the midpoint, both of these marks should be at the same point on the line. You have now found the neutral spot. Line up your neutral spot with the eye hole on the right column of the determinator for right-handed bowlers. Using a stopwatch or other accurate time-telling device, power on the determinator and start the stopwatch at the same time. Stop the watch when the ball has reached its PSA. For improved accuracy, 
repeat the spend time calculation three times and average those evaluations. So you saw the form that he was recording um, the items on in that previous um, little bit there at the end of that video. We have revamped and made the ball motion analysis form much easier to use. The content is still the same, but now it goes in order as you would actually process it on the lane. So that's why you're seeing a bit, a bit of a difference in the, the form on the video and the form you have in your hand. So real quick about spin time, the other thing I want to comment on is when you drill a bowling ball, the RG and your total dip and your intermediate dip and all those things are going to change. So you get the marketing information from the manufacturer and it tells you it's at such and such of an RG and then you get a, you get a, dif a differential. Um, obviously once you drill holes in that ball, you're changing the core shape, so you've changed your RG values. The really, only the real good way in the field to determine anything about the core in the ball is spin time. So that's why we use it as a measurement. Um, we're really looking at um, how asymmetrical that core has now been made. Um, the quicker the spin time, the more a asymmetrical that core tends to be. Um, so our spin time is less asymmetrical. It's just something to note because you, there's no way to actually measure RG in the field unless you have an RG swing. And I think there's only maybe a handful of people, like about three, in the field that have RG swings. So. We got to see those yesterday in the ball and testing room. Anybody have any, real quick, anybody have any questions on finding the PSA or doing the spin times? Have you seen this before? A few. Obviously those videos are on bull.com. If, if you get to that point and you're not quite sure how we did it, you can follow along there. So other than, than actually determining spin time, the other reason we need to locate the PSA is determine the drill layout of the ball. It's also known as actual layout on your sheet. Um, so once you drill a bowling ball, you put holes in the floor, it's changing the, the dynamics of the ball itself. Um, so here is an example from Color House Blueprint of a track 503A. So this is before drilling. You have your pin, your, your, the, the pin is the yellow, CG is the blue mark, and the PSA before drilling is the red. So once we drill it and put holes in it, and it, this was a pretty standard layout, I think it was 60 by four and a half by 30 or something like that, but um, once you drill it, the PSA can move. And that's what's, that, that is, or does move in most cases. And that's what's changing um, your, your drill layout from what you actually intended the ball to be initially. Um, in this diagram, the, uh, the pin or the low RG axis actually has moved from the pin. So that's your X axis. The PSA, here's the, the marking that would be on the ball. This is where it's shifted to. Um, and then this is your Z axis. This guy actually talks about the PAB of the ball. But this is something cool that uh, Blueprint does, but we wanted to be able to show and indicate, I don't know how many of you have had experience with uh, spinning a ball after it's been drilled, but the PSA can move off of that marking. Here's a couple examples of what we've seen. Um, this data set is from a, um, when we actually did this initially in 2010. But here's one bowling ball, and we noticed <coughs> that the intended layout was four and three quarters from pin to PAP distance, all using the dual angle system right here. You can use whatever layout system you want to look at this, but this is what we utilized for this example. Um, and then actually, when we measured it after drilling, it went to five and a half inches. Um, it, I mean, it, you're still getting, you're getting what you get out of the drilled ball, but it's just interesting, it's, it's a good thing to know.